So, hello and welcome. Thanks for registering for our webinar panel discussion hosted by World Leader in Building Analytics Software, CIM. Building on the success of previous sessions, we continue to explore the world of building operations and the future ahead. And it's great to see so many industry colleagues joining us, knowledgeable, of course, but and keen to learn and share more. The chair for the next 60 minutes, my name's Jim McClelland, I'm founder and editor of Sus Meme, home to both the magazine and the weekly bulletin. Our topic today, what commercial tenants expect from their buildings. I'll format this session slightly different as we're going to be reviewing some fascinating insights from recent research conducted by CIM in the UK market. There's some real food for thought to get you going. CIM undertook this study with tenants from large commercial office buildings, Respondents were pre-qualified. Their office space had to be above 50,000 square feet. They themselves needed to have authority in decision-making roles for office real estate. And our panel today, as ever, is an all-star lineup of industry experts passionate about the CRE market and asset performance, plus focused on accelerating progress towards a sustainable future. So let me introduce them. Joining me on screen this afternoon are Jason Kelleher, Area General Manager at CBRE, Workspace Solutions. Jason has worked in the facility space for the past 14 years across various sectors, manufacturing, retail, food production, and commercial office space. He has a technical maintenance background in pharma, petrochem, and healthcare, and he's worked for CBRE now for some five years, holding the position of area general manager for over a year, having started there as contract manager and then account director. Stephen O'Sullivan, is head of group workspace for Flutter Entertainment PLC. Flutter, some of you may know, is the FTSE 100 parent company for some of the world's biggest, most popular betting and gaming brands, including Paddy Power and Betfair. Stephen's team is responsible for the operational day-to-day -day delivery of workspace services across 60 locations worldwide, direct focus on workplace experience, ESG, and future workplace strategy. Stephen himself has over 12 years experience in corporate real estate working across a number of large multinationals such as Meta and Google. And then Killian Casey, Regional VP EMEA and US for CIM. Killian leads on all sales and operations for the region, prime responsibility for CIM's expansion there. Previously head of operations and customer success at CIM, so he's a true expert in building data analytics. He understands the challenges faced by clients and prospects. He's drawing on over 15 years experience in sustainability system integration and data analytics. He's a certified energy manager with a degree in mechanical engineering from Munster Technological University and is an MBA candidate at Smurfit Business School, University College Dublin, finishing any time now, I believe. Killian, I think so. It is all live and recorded, and you'll receive a copy of the recording following the broadcast. So a little bit of housekeeping. So, audience, we're on a tight schedule. If you do have a question for our panel, please pop it in the box at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a QA. and a we'll Try to get around to them in the final part of the session. Plus, CIM are very good at picking all questions up offline after the event. You should already have received a copy of the research report. If not, don't worry, it will be sent again along with the recording. Lastly, we kindly take a moment to complete the very short survey once we end this webinar. Feedback would be much appreciated. Right, let's kick things off with some of the stats from the survey. We're going to have a little presentation of the data to begin with. So, Killian, it's going to be over to you to share your screen and some of the findings, please. Thanks, Jim. You should be able to see the screen there now. Um, I will just give you an overview of some of the highlights uh, of the research white paper uh, that has just been released. All attendees here should have received a copy via email ahead of the webinar, um, but we'll be following up again afterwards, so we'll be ensured to include a link there as well. Um, there's also going to be a QR code on the next slide if you want to click into it as I'm going through. Um, the research paper was titled Mapping Tenant Preferences in the UK Office Market, again looking at the kind of the attitude and priorities of uh, tenants. So why did CIM complete this research? So we realized that real estate is a reshaping sector and is tackling multiple headwinds from inflation to interest rates, uh, work habits, governance pressure, etc. Uh, and this is something that we are hearing from all stakeholders, from tenants to operators to owners, etc. 
Uh, we wanted to understand this a bit more and the key threads of insight uncovered here is of enormous benefit to all stakeholders uh, across the sector. Uh, the research focuses on five areas. They are hybrid working, relocation, staff and attracting talent, net zero and rental costs. And again, you'll see this the QR code as I just touched on. Jim mentioned it, but the research was pre-qualified and all respondents had to meet certain criteria. Um, there were 200 UK directors and senior decision makers who have large commercial tenancies within properties all exceeding 50,000 square foot. And all respondents are involved in key real estate decisions. Um, and this research took place in April 2023, so it's pretty recent as well. Now to look at the, um, the first area reviewed, which was hybrid working, um, some key points of interest here are firstly looking at the current situation where 76% currently use hybrid working, 47% um, have a man mandated kind of hybrid model with a set requirement for office space. 28% uh, 20, is totally flexible where employees can decide if they want to be in the office or not. Um, and then 22% is fully office based. And then looking into the future, 75% are pushing return to office from a hybrid perspective with 23% with saying um, full-time office return is on the cards. The second topic is in relation to relocation. So 68% said they would consider moving their business if the building performance contradicts their ESG policy, while 41% have already actually moved office with another 27% considering it right now. And 32% said it's not really of big importance to them to do so. Looking at that relocation, 53% uh, said uh, reducing day-to-day -day operational and energy costs would influence uh, their choice when choosing an office space, whilst 49% consider a building sustainability credentials when, when choosing an office space. Uh, the chart on the left, uh, respondents could actually set multiple options or select multiple options, hence it doesn't add, add up to 100% in case some of you have your calculator out. Uh, looking at the talent uh, attraction and retention angle, 82% said the office building was important uh, from a value proposition to attract talent, whilst 89% said that net zero was an important employee value proposition. And then looking at the net zero a bit more, 75% said their office buildings were part of their net zero plans. 55% have an expectation that landlords need to show evidence of their efforts of hitting net zero, uh, whilst 4% are uh, not interested at all. And there's always those few. And then in terms of rental costs, so 94% would actually pay more for a greener building with a whopping 41% willing to pay over 10% extra. Uh, while 6% are not prepared to, to pay more at all. And then some quick points based on our research, um, but really this is uh, kind of the discussion we're going to have here today, so I don't want to draw too many conclusions just now, but some examples of how to address these could be about being you know, maybe more proactive, have a greater emphasis required on, on employee well-being and comfort, prioritize quality office space and investigate uh, technologies to empower operational teams. And again, you can see that QR code is there for you again. Excellent. Over Thank to you, Jim. You, Killian. Yeah, really good, um, really good kick us off there. Some very up-to-date stats and uh, on a good range of topics, hybrid working, relocation, staff, attraction, retention, net zero, and also, of course, rental costs. And we're going to cover just about all of those. But first off, I'd like to... Let's look a bit at the uh, drivers here, say ESG and sustainability. And in particular, I'll start with you maybe here, Stephen. So um, one of the first outcomes of the report we heard, 68% respondents felt they would move office due to a building being unsustainable and in conflict with their corporate ESG policy. So my first question to you is, does this ring true with your experience, Stephen? Yeah, look, Jim, I think it depends on your organization, the size of it, and your priorities when it comes to ESG. So Flutter is a FTSE 100 company, so we're listed on the London Stock Exchange. We're about to move over to the US, uh, to the Europe Stock Exchange as well. So from an investor relations perspective, uh, having a really strong ESG strategy is, is, is essential for us as an organization. 
And the start of that strategy is looking at the data piece, right? Where we are today, where we need to make improvements. So we've quite a diverse portfolio globally. Some buildings we have really great environments, really strong built environments that provide us that data. Hence the reason why we've partnered with the likes of CAM to be able to access additional data links. But we also have to make decisions around buildings where we're not getting that data, where they don't align to our ESG strategic goals. And when rent or lease events come up, we have to make decisions around whether it's time to move and look at a building that aligns to our ESG priorities and to partner with landlords as well from that perspective as well. So for us, really, the data is key and having buildings that are efficient to provide us that data, whether it's utilities, waste management, uh, that's really the starting point. There's no point setting goals and net based targets until we have that information, the data available. Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's kind of response. It depends. As you say, you're kind of you're up for public scrutiny, investor relations as a large FTSE 100. Um, but again, still, you have a portfolio different properties, different locations and geographies. And in truth, it can be a mixed bag. And that's where you're increasingly reliant on the data and you have to make decisions where potentially you don't have that data or you don't have the quality or quantity of data that you would like to be able to make uh, those strategic management decisions. So now I start, Jason, then if I come to you, you obviously view this from a slightly different lens, facilities management. Uh, plus, I should say, your role covers other types of buildings, not just offices, retail, manufacturing, etc. So your experience, are tenants and clients raising the issue of sustainability as a priority for CBRE? Are they actually talking about it? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and I suppose look, that trend has been increasing for the last number of years as people and businesses have become more environmentally aware and socially responsible. Um, but I do think that the decision making criteria when considering a potential relocation is more multifactorial than just ESG. Um, and I think what we've also seen is that companies are looking to reinvest in their, in their properties, particularly if they're in a, in a location that's um, meeting all of their other needs. So like easily commutable, mm -hmm. good public transport infrastructure, opportunity to expand, or they may want to be near universities, residential centers, or um, consolidated living space areas. So if their current location has all of the characteristics that they desire as a business, and obviously then depending on their lease agreement, then they may look to invest in their building as part of their ESG strategy, but equally as a long-term lease commitment, or even as a staff retention strategy. Um, and that investment can take many forms. And they may look at things like remediating building heating loss or at more efficient heating and cooling systems, better BMS control, um, improved water usage, or, or maybe even investing in PV systems. Um, and that investment as well can be a shared burden of res responsibility on both the landlord and, and the tenant. And I have seen that where a tenant or a landlord will leverage reinvestment into a building as a lease negotiation tool. Um, both sides obviously looking to improve their position, but obviously looking to improve the property as well. Um, looking at client demand for sustainability in FM is a broader topic. Um, sustainable FM has, has developed significantly from, I suppose, what had been an emerging theme about 15 or 20 years ago to one of the key focus areas today in, in our industry. Uh, and primarily because buildings are responsible for about 40% of total energy consumption in Europe. I think it's 43% at the last estimate uh, and about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So when you look at the three pillars of sustainable buildings, uh, economic, environmental, and social benefits, there has been a realization that sustainable FM has a positive effect on, on those three pillars. In practical terms, I think most um, FM professionals will translate sustainability to mean technical solutions um, that contribute to the reduction of energy consumption of buildings. But look, in my opinion, um, in addition to energy, uh, FM managers should be involved with the entire uh, facility life cycle from design um, and construction to disposal, but maintaining that heavy emphasis on the operational phase. Now, look, that, that's not always achievable. We rarely have that uh, level of input at the design and construction stage. So then we're relying on innovation through retrofitting or introduced technology. And that's certainly something that we've seen a significant demand for. Um, and look, you know, when it comes to that, it's, it's all about data and utilizing data to make uh, uh, informed decisions. And that really is the key. And I suppose where just previously there may have been a shortage of data due to a lack of technology or unwillingness for clients to invest. Um, now we're seeing that there is a genuine appetite for data availability. Um, and clients are seeing that the cost to achieve is offset by um, the long term benefits for ESG and, and savings from, from energy reduction. Excellent. Thanks. Some nice points made there to start. So as you say, ESG, 
the decisions potentially are multifactorial. They might want to reinvest, retrofit, renovate, remediate. In other words, stick, not twist. They're happy with the office in many other regards, and they can put some money into uh, perhaps uh, improving some of the ESG factors. Sustainability, a broader kind of discussion. And I think, um, although obviously a lot of it's about energy use efficiency, carbon and emissions. I think the sustainability picture is also bringing in more health and well-being and, uh, you know, occupier welfare and also circular economy and a range of other things and being able to talk with data across the different topics and be able to potentially pitch to the C-suite or to other directors with other priorities. I think we're in an interesting space now where it's a real growing up phase for the sustainability discussion, you know, and uh, the better the data, the more we can have an informed talk about it. So on that note then, Killian, coming to you on this first question. So from the tech point of view, not just CIMs, climate tech, sustainable tech talked about a lot, but is there really enough being developed in the sector for corporate tenants to actually ensure their building does support and achieve those kinds of sustainability goals we're talking about? Have they got what they need? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Jim. It's definitely a very interesting one. Um, from a technology perspective, climate tech and sustainability tech sectors have been kind of receiving a lot of attention, mm -hmm. um, particularly probably in the last three years or so. Uh, there does seem to be a kind of a new company pop up every other week as well in this yep, place. Yep. Um, and there is an ever growing focus on the development and advancement of these technologies. Um, without using technology, there is no real chance that companies will come next to or near kind of emission reduction targets, which are often extremely aggressive. And again, rightly so. Uh, so there is an abundance of technology, some very good, like CIM's big platform, of course, and uh, some maybe not so good. Um, like I'm not, I'm not going to say actually any other technologies, but uh, can can technologies evolve further? Absolutely. Will they? Absolutely. Will that be enough to solve the problem? You know, absolutely not. It's you know crucial to acknowledge as well that the development of tech alone is not sufficient. And Jason kind of touched on that uh, to address all the sustainability challenges faced by corporations and, and tenants. And there are things that are working well, and there are things maybe that are not working well. Now, looking at things that are kind of working well. Typically, um, more data available in buildings, particularly more modern and upgraded buildings, uh, meaning with the, the right technology, you can have kind of awesome insights that really um, hold your hand in many ways, mm -hmm. bringing you on that emission reduction journey. Um, we have improving renewable infrastructure, either on-site generation or um, at the utility. And again, this will help to an extent, but we still need a massive cut on the consumption in the fields to ensure that we have sufficient green energy capacity. Uh, and also there's a real interest by tenants and companies to attack this problem and attack it urgently, which leads uh, me to some maybe the problems. Um, in terms of what's not working well, there is a confusion, there's low adoption or at least nowhere near enough adoption and perhaps the awareness is not what it should be. Um, I think because of the confusion, this is leading to kind of a, a paralysis by analysis. And in turn, there are no decisions been made by tenants or building owners and in, in many ways, this is really understandable, again, due to the, I suppose, the noise and what's happening around in this space. Um, you can kind of go three ways here. You can you know, make the right call on the right technologies you use, which is the best results. You can make the wrong call and choose maybe a technology that's not right for you, which is the second best result. Or you can make no decision and do nothing, which is probably the worst choice. And, and, and many companies are kind of stuck here as well at the moment. Yeah, good. good. Good analysis there, as you said, sort of at the start, I mean, in the wake of, if you like, fintech, for example, we have Pytech, Sustech, you know, we have buzzword bingo with everything ending in tech, if you like, and understandably so. But as you said, tech alone is not the answer, but it is a critical enabler. And I thought you made a nice point about the insights can effectively hold the hand, they, they get rid of the fear factor, they can de-risk decision making, potentially de-risk spend de-risk investment because the data supports the choices being made but you know and avoid some of that paralysis by analysis so um yeah much to think about then so taking us then on to question two and the topic doesn't get any smaller it possibly even gets bigger because we're going to have a little chat this bit now about net zero dive into another of the research findings so 96 percent almost everybody expressed an interest in proof of net zero from their landlord proof. 55% expect to see it. 
41% are interested in seeing it. So Jason, kick off for you this time. CBRE sit in the middle, if you like, between the landlord, the tenant, managing and operating the building. Is this proof of net zero scenario happening? And crucially, how can it be evidenced? Um, I suppose, look, again, it depends on what stage of the building life cycle that we're engaged in. Um, like globally, we manage about 7 billion square feet of office space. So of every shape, size and age imaginable. So if we're contracted to manage a building, say that's 20 years old, with little prior, prior investment into making the building greener, then it's, it's not proof of net zero, it's a path to net zero. For proof of net zero, uh, environmental certification schemes like BREAM or LEED um, are very popular with building owners and developers. And in some instances, they're a prerequisite by potential occupiers before they sign a lease. Um, for ourselves as CBRE, look, we've published a significant amount of literature on, on path to net zero and proof of net zero um, and how we support client energy programs for smart FM technology developed by um, ourselves and, and by our supply partner. In fact, look, I suppose that's how I met, was introduced to CIM first was uh, working with Killian on an energy program um, in a large manufacturing facility in Cork. Um, so look for companies, I suppose, that are reinvesting into their business through energy projects. We can forecast then how that investment reduces their energy usage. Um, I suppose initially as part of a business justification case um, and then a completion through to live data reporting to measure um, those energy reductions. Um, so, for example, if, if we were looking at, say, replacing AC motors for EC fans or install, installing, say, an intelligent boiler control system to reduce dry cycling, uh, we can forecast things like um, annual estimated fuel savings, kilowatt hour mm -hmm. savings, CO2 reduction, cost savings, um, and justify the, the, the ROI. So then I suppose following that on project completion, we can monitor that through real-time data analytics tools, something like Peak Platform, um, to get our trend analysis and measure the reductions year on year um, or month to month or day to day. And that, that then I suppose is, is your proof of net zero. But again, it's back to having the data available to present and interpret to our clients uh, and, and report that to our, our state, stakeholders. Um, look, the, the thing about proof of net zero though is that for many companies, it, it also encompasses their supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, 85% of the carbon footprint for non-manufacturing companies is in their supply chain. So for us as CBRE, well, we can commit to net zero, which we have. We published our corporate responsibility report only last month, uh, and that set out our key milestones and strategic objectives for our net zero goals. Uh, we also then have a duty of care to our clients that our supply chain are targeting net zero as well, yep. um, and that they have a comprehensive policy and a mission statement to achieve that goal. Um, and I suppose no more so than ever, that's the expectation of our clients, that not only are we journeying towards net zero, but that our supply partners are, are making that journey as well. Excellent. Thanks. Some good points. So as you say, it does very much depend on the state of the building life cycle, perhaps where you're getting involved. Brian lead um, familiar programs, uh, global. Um, but also, if it is the case that it's more a journey towards net zero, as you sort of implied there and we'll come to later, then it's a question of tracking progress and potentially evidencing the ROI and proving that the money spent has got results and that mm -hmm. you can um show that you are um recovering from perhaps um a less than ideal position to begin with um but a good point about supply chain scope three various industries are still only just really beginning to talk about that um you know and um construction and buildings have obviously a huge and long supply chain and there's, there's a terrific amount of scope there for improvement, but it's challenging. So, um, yeah, much to come to in that regard. So then, Stephen, if I come to you now at the other side of the uh, counter, if you like, as a tenant, um, do you receive this proof of net zero or journey to net zero? Otherwise, how are you ensuring your building is sustainable, will remain sustainable and keep working to help you achieve your targets? Do you get that piece of paper? Not in every location, no, in every building, and that's the challenge. Like, we only very recently set our science-based targets as an organization, and Jason mentioned about the pathway journey. It's very difficult coming after it, at it after the fact, and something we're doing now when we go to site selection phase is coming with a list of our key requirements. So, And again, it's not just focused on ESG. It can be location, availability of amenities, transport links, all of that. 
but it has to happen at site selection phase and partnering with landlords so they can understand your ESG strategy. So they understand what you need from that building in terms of the performance, the assets, life cycling within that building, and also the data that you can get from that building as well. So I think one of our challenges, we've had a lot of assets that have, some have been on the books for over 20 years, and we're now trying to start that journey with an old asset and not having access to the data, but also I said previously, we've quite a diverse portfolio. Some landlords, it's not high on their agenda in certain countries. Look, we're lucky enough in Europe, we have certain directives that apply to organizations around energy management. We don't have that at a global level. So it is very difficult to leverage support from landlords. And in some cases, we've almost had to invest ourselves in terms of getting that data. So adding meters to buildings, improving the BMS systems within certain assets as well. But like I said previously, it's almost now making a decision when we when we come to a lease event whether we continue to invest in that building or we decide that look a specific landlord doesn't align to our ESG goals. They're probably going to set us off when we when we look at our science based targets and not having that availability of data. And it's really accountability as well. So I know that like the Paris Agreement itself is 2050, and it's, it's very easy to say now about setting science based targets and goals as an organisation and let somebody else worry about it in 27 years time, right? Uh, the accountability now is, is quite valuable. And in some cases, we may get data on a monthly basis. And, and in some cases, from landlords, we get a quarterly, yearly. So it is a challenge depending on where your portfolio is located and, and the asset that you're currently occupying. Yeah, good point. So, I mean, good shout there for science-based targets, of course. But as you say, especially if you have a diverse portfolio in different geographies, for example, different regulatory regimes, perhaps different economic pressures and circumstances, different property and business markets, um, it's not a one size fits all scenario, uh, but key word you mentioned also accountability, which, of course, um, as a, a public profile company um, is is going up and up the agenda. So then, Killian, if I come to you, uh, CIO has been mentioned in dispatches a few times already. So happy days. But uh, for those in the audience less familiar capabilities, I wonder if you could give some examples of what data analytics can really do here. I think you've got a, maybe a couple more bits you might share on your screen. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just get to that in a sec. Um, like analytics software has has a number of roles to play in this space. It provides visibility and what you need to do to kind of cut your energy and carbon emissions. It alerts you to easy to convert low cost emission reduction wins. And it also provides kind of a line of sight to the more capital intensive decisions around, you know, which equipment should I replace first to get the best bang for my buck, given the budgetary constraints. Yeah. And then it also allows you to track and measure what has worked and maybe what hasn't worked. And just to give you a few examples, I will share now. So hopefully it will work second time as well. Um, yeah, it seems to be working. So then looking at the, I suppose, the energy consumption side of things. So that analytics can, can provide a clear overview of the building's energy consumption patterns over time through visualizations and reports. And through this, then stakeholders can kind of see the energy usage fluctuations throughout the day, identify, you know, peak consumption periods and assess the effectiveness of, of energy saving measures, as I touched on. Here you can see kind of a portfolio overview of energy, gas, water and waste generation across a number of facilities. And you can then kind of benchmark versus your target reductions to ensure you are hitting them or flag when you are not essentially then looking at the carbon emissions component, so building analytics software can kind of calculate and present the carbon emissions associated with the, the building operations um, by integrating energy consumption data with you know, emission factors. Stakeholders can visualize the, the carbon footprint uh, of the building over time, and then this helps demonstrate the building's contribution to reducing um, its greenhouse gas emissions and its alignment with the net zero, net zero goals. And then when you're even looking at bringing in the kind of renewable energy component, which I, I touched on earlier, if the building has uh, integrated renewable energy sources such as solar uh, or wind turbines, that analytics can then provide real-time insights into the energy generated uh, from these sources. And then metrics such as you know re renewable energy generation, the percentage of energy derived from renewables, mm -hmm. renewables are you know, avoided carbon emissions can be visualized to, to highlight the building's progress in transitioning towards net zero uh, by leveraging the clean energy this time. And again, this chart is showing the green component, which is essentially the amount of energy that's been consumed, um, which has been generated by the on-site wind turbine. And you can see the fluctuation day to day, depending on how windy it is essentially. And some days it's hitting up to 
the 95 percent of uh the on-site consumption which is which is pretty powerful um and then you've got the efficiency improvements as well where data analytics can kind of showcase the impact of the efficiency measures implemented in the building by anal analyzing the data from various systems and subsystems um and then stakeholders can then observe the improvements in the energy and the carbon emission um, efficiency metrics great stuff thanks well that's um it's always really good to literally see the numbers the bar charts on the screen as you said everything from energy consumption carbon emissions including renewables nice point there and real-time insights and multiple metrics so um nice well that takes us forward now to the second half if you like of our discussion and we're beginning with a topic that's on the lips of many an organization at the moment the whole back to the office debate um we're going to explore what factors tenants really look for when they're moving office particularly as there's this push for a greater return albeit on a hybrid basis so i'll remind um audience and panel of one or two of the stats that came out in the research there i mean some are more obvious than others so what are people looking for? Well, not surprisingly, 47% said higher quality modern space. You expect that. 43% maybe a flexible lease. But 36%, that's over a third, prioritizing staff health and well-being benefits, and almost a similar number improved tech. But one of the big numbers here, I thought caught my eye was 81%, eight out of 10, more than, said. The office building was part of their employee value proposition and or benefits pitch. So that's that attraction and retention scenario there. So, Stephen, if I start with you here talking about some of these issues, as we've all said, tenant needs are changing, even advancing, looking not just at space, location, cost now, but we flutter large tenant and number of buildings. Do these kinds of needs that we're flagging as priorities, do they align with yours? And if so, how do you manage the key stakeholder, employees, your landlords, to actually deliver against those? It's one thing to say this is what we like. It's another about how you actually deliver. Jim, the, uh, the workplace has become a lot more transactional in the last couple of years. So staff want to get value for their time visit to the office. So we've definitely had to flip our focus to be more experience focused. So we've invested a lot more in our built environments themselves. So fortunately during COVID itself, we actually refurbished our Dublin office. So staff were coming back to a really great environment, albeit too big for what we actually needed. <laughs> uh, but we continue to look at our amenities in the office to use it as a draw, right? And to drive better engagement with the office. So when staff do decide to come to the office, they find value in that visit and purpose also. So depending whether it's the space that they use when they come in that day, the type of event they want to host, uh, but there's definitely a need to to look at it on an ongoing basis. So something we've been doing is we trend utilization data across every day of the week and understanding other certain days that drive engagement over others. What was the reason that there was higher engagement? Was it a specific event? Was it a specific amenity? So we do pop-ups and surprise events some days within the office as well to just drive that bit more engagement on certain days. Uh, but I think, look, it's important to also recognize that regardless of how great the environment is in, the, in this day and age, it is still a challenge. There's a lot of external factors that are fighting against the internal environment of the office. So it's easier to get out of bed in the morning and go to the office right beside your bedroom, uh, transport as well. If you're close to the office or not, it can be a challenge. Also, the time it takes in terms of commuting. So that's where we find the challenge. We, we looked at some of our offices where we've got really, really great environments. But the external factors still outweigh mm. that, that challenge of, of staff wanting to come and use it. And I think sometimes the C-suite can get distracted by the build it and they will come mantra, yep. whereby really it's about right-sizing your environment and really understanding what are the amenities and services that staff really want to engage with. So something that we're taking out as part of our, our future workplace strategy is really understanding the key amenities that staff use and not investing in services and spaces that we really don't need. Uh, but it is it, it is critical to continuously engage with the business and have that data to understand what, what people want to do when they come into our buildings. Absolutely. Taking that strategic view, nice phrase used about uh, the workplace becoming more transactional and you necessarily becoming more experience focused. It's like the UX scenario. But an acknowledgement, there are external factors. These might be the commute, childcare arrangements, there are a lot of other factors to consider as part of the overall package. And uh, that's the reality check 
if you like. So, Jason, coming to you. So, we all know the role of FM can be extremely busy dealing with urgent issues. You know, they the must happen now, even complaints, let's be honest, uh, whilst, whilst at the same time keeping the building operating um, for all concerns. So, tenants, they're, they're expecting not only more, but they're expecting proof that it's been delivered. So how can FM actually manage this and how do you track it all in amongst all that busy, hectic schedule of urgent responses? Yeah, look, I think I would agree with a lot of what um, Stephen said there. I think it's all about understanding your client and understanding their needs. Um, I suppose, look, the workplace is no longer becoming a place where you come in, you drop your laptop, you do eight hours of work and you go home. COVID changed all that, right? But I think that change was happening anyway. Um, I, I like I can remember doing workplace occup uh, occupancy surveys and work workplace utilization surveys in 2017 and 2018. You know the hybrid model was starting to become more prevalent then. Um, and now I think you need to you know you, you need to attract people to the office, uh, and when they're there, make sure that you've created an environment that they want to stay there. So there's no more of a kind of a destination workplace approach, which in reality is is kind of what what, what it's come to. And again. Um, to align with what Stephen said, it's an experience for your customers. And if that experience isn't good for the first two or three times, you know, will they will they come back? Um, I, I look, I suppose, well, I think that FM is, you know, hard services and, and soft services are very important. I do think there's a more prevalent role now for event management within FM because people are coming in are expecting to come into work now for a lot of uh, collaboration reasons. So, for example, say your your engineering department wants to come in. And maybe they only come in three or four times a month. You know, when, when they come in, uh, the director may want the boardroom to themselves for the day or a, a multifunctional room. They may want to bring in food. They may want other types of technologies in, in, in the room that may or may not be available at the moment. And as FMs, we need to be aware of that and build up that type of resource infrastructure so that we create that positive uh, customer experience. And that's, again, is all around understanding your client in terms of the events that they want to organize in order to bring their teams in and to foster that, that collaboration. And I think that's probably the change that we're seeing now is we're actually more going into a more flexible, adaptive type of workplace um, that we have to provide in order for people to come in and, and, and to collaborate. And, you know, it, it's very interesting. I was in a building earlier this year um, that was designed during COVID. And the whole flow of the building was entirely different. There was, you know, lots of collaboration mm -hmm. space. Lots of multifunctional spaces, lots of flexi spaces, total hot desk approach, with the exception of a, a few offices for um for the ELT. So, I believe as an FM, I think this is where we really should be involved in early design. And, and in that instance, uh, the FM team were um were very involved in, in, in the design of that building, um, because I think we understand what people think out there in terms of what they want. Um, I think if we're involved in early design fit outs um, in order to give employees more flexibility in terms of what space they're coming into, then our role becomes more enhanced, right? Um, I think within our own business, the feedback that I get from sites is yes, um, and from clients specifically, is that their biggest focus is, is, is driving growth of the business and expansion. But no, they're also committed to ambitious climate goals and sustainability goals. You know, there's, there's a big focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and employee well-being and in the facilities world that translates to it translates to creating that workplace experience that's a big big element now of the uh, facilities manager's role because there's a bigger focus in ensuring that the workplace is inviting to prospective employees who are joining the company but also to existing employees to attract them to come into the into the office mm -hmm. and to retain them and i suppose that's becoming more and more of a responsibility on the uh, on the facilities manager yeah, nice point there. So as you say, no longer simply a destination workplace approach, experience focus, as um, Stephen was saying. Nice point about bigger role for event management with FM, because you basically have different usage patterns um, across different days, weeks, months, quarters, even flexible and adaptive. And of course, a call for involvement at the early design stage to the likes of FM, because bolting on stuff bells and whistles after the event is um, always difficult always expensive and in some cases downright impossible so um, yeah early involvement so Gillian so we're talking about this whole changing landscape changing tenant changing FM but of course faster pace than almost anything is the world of tech so to what degree is the technology developing to respond to these new expectations from tenants 
and at the same time supporting the building operators trying to deliver day to day. So how, how is your world changing to keep pace or to anticipate? Yeah, look, this, this is a definitely um, a very important topic regarding the, I suppose, evolving expectations of tenants even. The, the survey findings mm -hmm. clearly highlight that the, the tenants the tenants now have much higher expectations. You know, has technology developed in recent times uh, to support these new expectations from both the tenant and building operators' perspectives? Absolutely, yes, it has. You know, for example, we've seen a massive leap forward with respect to areas such as you know health and well-being solutions, and this includes you know air quality monitoring technologies, which leverage maybe existing data and also other smart sensor technologies of which building analytics platforms play a critical part. And then there are the, the, the wellness platforms that, that kind of provide resources for mental and physical health as well. And by leveraging these technologies, tenants can kind of create a healthier and healthier and more productive work environment for, for their employees. Um, technology then kind of has enabled the development of smart building systems that enhance the quality and modernity of the office spaces. So uh, you know, systems including included things like, you know, advanced HVAC controls, intelligent lighting mm -hmm. solutions, um, integrated security systems, uh, smart energy management platforms, you know, such mm -hmm. technologies provide tenants with kind of a greater control, greater comfort uh, and efficiency within their work environments, which feeds into that modern space that was touched on. Um, then from a building operator's perspective, um, technology advancements have really allowed building operators to deploy, you know, advanced automation and workflows that kind of optimize building operations and, and maintenance. Uh, and then these systems enable things like uh, remote monitoring, you know, predictive maintenance, real-time data analytics, which really helps operators deliver higher quality and more reliable building services whilst also kind of reducing costs and energy waste. And then data analytics kind of, I suppose, and performance of monitoring has really helped to revolutionize building operations from this sense. And then finally, I guess, when it comes to sustainability and energy management, technology plays a crucial role in kind of supporting building operators and achieving sustainability goals. You know, the greater demands for tenants or from tenants uh, to lease greener mm -hmm. spaces means greater pressure on the operators. And yep. without technology, driving buildings to their peak performance is very challenging, especially when you consider all the other demands on building operators teams as well, basically. So yeah, I think that's going to echo even what Jason said. Exactly. And it's also a nice segue into what we're going to talk about next, in a sense, because um, nice points there. You say massive leap forward, the likes of indoor air quality, IAQ, of course, COVID accelerated that up the agenda, if you like. Health and well-being, wellness, keywords like smart and intelligent, you know, and, and it's not too bold to say we are talking about a data analytics revolution here. But then if we... We'll get this is we've got a couple of questions left and we're we're now sort of nearly 20 minutes to go but this is one of those it's cost so i'd like to ask you guys about show me the money time so in terms of what the research revealed rental costs pretty amazing to see despite the tough economic climate i know it's not getting any easier we're in right now but 94 percent of respondents said they would pay more for sustainable greener office space 41 percent will pay more than 10 percent over and 14 that's almost one in seven would pay more than 15 one five percent those are really encouraging numbers so perhaps you're going to burst the bubble here steve so i'm saying they're really encouraging numbers does that mirror your expectations do you think landlords are already adding a green premium for sustainable buildings I think it depends on the office you're looking at. So right now, a lot of companies are potentially downsizing. So they have an opportunity to maybe go for more premium space mm -hmm. and a space that offers more alignment to their ESG goals. I think landlords also need to be showing the tangible value of charging that bit more for greener space. And that can't just be about having beehives on the roof, right? You're not going to get long-term value from that as, as, as a tenant, right? So uh, I think it's really... I talked about the site selection fee has been key in terms of what are your key, key goals when it comes to ESG and what do you want out of your environment? And I think, yes, as a business, we are willing to invest more. And I think when we go to CFO and the business to get approval around business cases, 
having ESG as part of that conversation brings a lot of weight to it because mm -hmm. we know it aligns to our strategy as a business. Uh, and we know that for certain assets these days, whether it is Lee Platinum certified, Bream certified, you are going to need to pay that bit more. Yeah. But you also need to look at the cost saving value that you will get in return for that. So certain spaces that are greener are going to be cheaper to run. Uh, there'll be less requirements around maintenance, lower costs. And any of the assets that may be owned by tenants themselves, there may be less ongoing capital commitment and reinvestment required as well. So there is there is cost saving value on top of investing more in a green space as well. Uh, but again, look, it, it depends on the strategic goals of an organization. In the past, it was always around being very cost sensitive, regardless of the environment that you're getting. But I think for us as an organization, we are willing to invest more. But it's also now looking at that where we're right sizing our portfolio, we have that bit more money to spend on the right location that supports our employees' needs from an amenities and transport perspective. But also there is a lot more attention from employees around environment sustainability within the organization. So there is this interest in saying, and, and noticeability about the buildings that we have and the environments that we set. So staff have it on their agenda as well. So it, it does form part of that employee attraction piece as well. Excellent, some good points there. Sort of suggesting, in a sense, green as an element of less is more, less space, but greener potentially. Um, and of course, the payback might be better. You might get some cost savings over time, especially on, say, energy efficiency and the like. Um, but you're going to need some tangible benefits beyond beehives, as you said. And I think there's an interesting suggestion there you know, from your perspective. You might have more rigorous demands led by your ESG strategy, etc. But you're also a big name, so. The football analogy is a little element of maybe, you know, a Manchester City type scenario where the price goes up for any player you want to buy because you're you have a high profile and you're known to be one of the bigger operators. So, you know, there is that commercial pressure as well to um, max up the value for those who are in the market for uh, or more. So, Jason, then, so if I'm coming to you on this um, from the building operations side portfolio you manage, is it? actually becoming greener or in all honesty is there still a lot of redevelopment and retrofitting to be done um yes certainly uh, again my portfolio is, is a mix of new and old um and of different industries so if i were to compare it's not apples for apples um but if you were to ask me do i see measurable progression i would say yes 100 percent um, the newer buildings that my team would manage would be all built i would say within the last four to five years so obviously better materials, better technology, better data, and, and more efficient. Uh, for the more mature locations, yes, there is more investment required. Um, and I suppose as FM supply partners with a projects division, we're also always involved in, in the project delivery there. So we need to be clear not only on what our clients are looking for, but where we can bring real value, say, around energy re reduction, decarbonization, and future proof proofing client infrastructure uh, investments. Um, but look, I, I do see other client sites making significant pro uh, progress. And, you know, I had a conversation last year with uh, with a client who was a head of production in a large manufacturing industry uh, about their de decarbonization strategy and how we're helping them with that. Uh, now, for their business, it's a multifaceted approach because they're also looking at reducing their, their energy costs. Uh, and I appreciate that, that they're mm -hmm. not mutually exclusive. But I suppose just to give you a sense of scale, uh, post Ukrainian war, they reforecasted their energy cost to plus 28 million from their original estimation. So, decarbonization and energy reduction are two of the strategic pillars of, strategic pillars of their environmental roadmap um, and also part of their uh, energy reduction policy and, and cost saving. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think businesses, I suppose, are now are becoming laser focused on the carbon, fo carbon footprint of their operations. Um, that's driven at a corporate level in most cases, but obviously then implemented at, at the local level. Um, and that implementation then is achieved through operational changes, um, energy reduction projects, smart FM, intelligent, build, intelligent building systems, as, as Killian said earlier. And so again, back to an earlier point I made about data, um, it has to be data driven. And I think that's where it has stalled previously, through a paucity of data to inform key decisions. You know, like an old saying, what you can't measure, you can't manage, right? You need to know where you are at a point in time and then set achievable goals for where you want to be next year, the year after, three years' time, five years' time. Build and set out your business or site master plan, formulate your project pipeline, build your business cases, secure your capital investment. And like, make no mistake about it, there will be significant demand on materials and labor in the coming years. 
So look, you may not achieve everything, but you should at least have a strategy, right? Um, and make it agile, make it flexible, make it adaptable, but make it progressive. You know, there is a difference between being approximately right and, and precisely wrong. So I suppose look to answer your question, yes, there is still lots of work to do, but I think everyone has their head in the game now and we're all pulling in, in, the, in the same direction. Excellent. So good to hear, yes, work to do, but everybody's at least in the game, as you say, can't compare apples with apples. Progression, so I used a nice phrase for, for kind of older properties, which we're talking about a lot as maybe more problematic. You say more mature, which sounded like um, that euphemism for people in their middle youth, you know, so you've got buildings are in their middle youth, you know, so, um, but also the laser focus now on carbon. And in truth, there is an opportunity there for building analytics and FM and to try and speak to that agenda intelligently and get some changes made and things done and improvements um, by providing the right data and metrics um, to get decisions made in the boardroom. So Killian, on that, we've talked about the, um, the development of the tech, we've talked about the changing market, but what about the actual adoption rate? In other words, people using the stuff that's available. Is that happening fast enough to maintain the kind of metrics and measurement and to guarantee these greener, sustainable buildings? Um, well, when you consider the, the current state of tech adoption, I think it's pretty evident that the op the adoption rate isn't kind of where it needs to be, though you obviously do have leaders in the space, you know, we're chatting to mm -hmm. Flutter and, and CBRE who are well on top of it, obviously, at the moment. Um, whilst the survey kind of results indicate a willingness amongst respondents to pay more rent for such spaces, the reality is um, the implementation and integration of sustainable technologies in the real estate sector is certainly lagging behind. Um, numerous factors probably uh, contribute to this. So firstly, there may be a lack of awareness and understanding amongst the stakeholders about the benefits and, and maybe the potential return on investments associated with such yeah, sure. sustainable technologies. And, and this can result in a, a reluctance to maybe prioritize and invest in, in these solutions. Um, secondly, you know, there are challenges related to cost effectiveness and scalability of sustainable mm -hmm. solutions in some instances. Uh, some technologies may still be in their early stages of development or have limited availability, which kind of makes them expensive are impractical for widespread adoption and then yep. additionally the integration and um, interoperability of the different systems can be complex and time consuming further hindering their implementation now luckily solutions such as cim's peak uh, software solution does not have these challenges and allows you kind of to see these results instantly um but there's different kind of technologies and different stages of the of, of the journey um furthermore you know aggressive targets for mm -hmm. sustainability as well as kind of the increasing tenant demands that we touched on for greener spaces necessitate a much greater adoption rate in the coming years. Um, with the growing recognition, you know, the environmental impact of buildings and the urgency to mitigate climate change, the industry must probably embrace this technology at a much faster pace. And then to kind of address these challenges and, and meet tenant demand stakeholders need to kind of take bold actions, right? Um, looking at governments, regulatory bodies, they should establish really stronger incentives and mandates uh, to encourage the adoption of uh, these kind of greener uh, practices and, and technologies in, in both construction and then also in operations. And, and I guess this is something as an Australian country or uh, company, we've seen them kind of do very well down there and they're at the forefront of it. Um, Essentially, the current tech adoption rate for sustainable greener buildings probably falls short in what it's needed to be to meet the tenant demands and the aggressive targets and a significantly greater um, adoption rate is probably required in the coming years to, to keep up with the demands. Excellent. Essentially. Yeah, it make, makes, makes sense. Call for more adoption. Not surprisingly, as you say, real estate as a sector typically has been lagging behind a little bit in tech terms. There's maybe an acknowledgement almost, perhaps not CIM, of course, but there is a better sales job to be done by the solutions providers in terms of selling the benefits to those clients, you know, and speeding that adoption as there is with any emerging uh, technology scenario. But there's cost, the scalability. It's an evolving market, if you like. But a nice point about government and regulatory bodies um, also part of the point and giving that kind of push to encourage the pull of demand. So we are into just about the last five minutes. So panel it is quick fire last round of comments it's last orders here and Killian I'm coming to you first so I'm going to ask you pretty much the same question each 
So we're going to have three nuggets here for the audience to take away with them. So no pressure. So Killian, you're first up. What's your key takeout from the research and whether it's achievable? So what's your number one takeaway? Uh, I'm not used to going first here, so this is a change to finish <laughs> it up. So uh, probably the key takeaway from the research for me is, is I guess, the, the importance or the willingness of tenants to, to pay more for rent on the, the commercial office, and the office leases. I, I found that interesting. Um, and this uh, this finding should really serve as a strong driver for asset owners to place an increased focus on on the green credentials of their buildings, um, particularly in today's uncertain landscape with office occupancy levels clearly on the decline. Tenants are becoming more selective mm -hmm. in their choice of office spaces. And Stephen obviously touched as well on downsizing. Um, and there's also an increasing availability of office spaces off the back of this. Um, they are not only considering factors, you know, such as location and amenities, uh, but also prioritizing sustainability and environmental responsibility. And I know Jason touched on that a while ago as well, talking about it's not just any one thing, it's really kind of a compilation uh, of everything. Um, the fact that tenants are willing to pay more for rent to secure a sustainable and green office yep. space underscores the growing importance of these credentials in the market, and it presents a unique opportunity for asset owners to really differentiate their properties and attract and retain high quality tenants. And then by investing in the sustainable features and even the certifications, again, that was touched on earlier, asset owners can kind of demonstrate their commitment to this, um, I suppose, environmental stewardship. Uh, and then moreover, emphasizing the green credentials of their building can probably contribute to a long-term cost saving for asset owners. Um, energy efficiency, every energy efficient buildings often have you know lower operating expenses, reduced maintenance needs, mm -hmm. and can command higher rents due to their appeal to the environmentally conscious tenants. Good stuff, sir. And, and I remind people of the stat for that was 94% said they might be willing to express the willingness to pay more for sustainable greener office. So number one takeaway, willingness to pay more for those kind of um, green and sustainable benefits. Jason, same question to you then. Your, your, your main last one takeout so if the audience remember one thing from everything we've discussed in the survey research, what's that one thing for you, Jason? Um, I suppose look, I think it's very heartening to see that um, so many people are becoming informed now, um, about the functionality of their building about, and about what they are demanding of their office workspace. Um, I think that, you know, seeing how prevalent ESG now is becoming in, mm -hmm. in staff retention, in, in hiring uh, functions, uh, again, I think that that's that's hugely optimistic for the uh, the real estate environment. Um, uh, again, and I, I've said it now a couple of times, but data is is the key. Data is you know what we use as business business justification to make uh, informed key decisions. Um, and it's really really good to see that um, landlords, tenants, um, you know, uh, decision makers that they want to be informed, that they want to. To, to receive that data that they want to be able to interpret that data um so yeah again uh, you know that i suppose for me is, is the message to take away is you know um good to see that people are, are keeping it being informed good to see that there's more of an eye toward more towards um esg towards sustainability mm -hmm. um and I, I think that's really positive excellent yeah positives there growth and awareness and understanding as you say a much more informed marketplace with an appetite for more but all all underpinned by the data that enables that kind of learning and that educational piece, if you like. So last word, final word to you, Stephen, you can trump the other two. This is your opportunity with the one takeaway. So what, what's your, what's your big must remember thing from the, the research in today, Stephen? I think the most interesting uh, figure that I saw was around the 70% of respondents thought to be returned to office for at least three days a week in the next two years. So I'm very interested to see whether that's by mandate or by organic growth and return to office. So, and I think, look, that will be very much determined by the environment that you create for employees. So I've spoken to numerous organizations that have done mandates. It's had no impact on utilization levels, but for companies that have invested in their assets, their amenities, the whole benefit package around employees, they have seen an organic growth in utilization without need and mandates. So I'm interested to see where that goes over the next couple of years and whether we get back to three, four days a week, or even just a four day a week becomes it becomes into play as well. It's, it's going to be interesting to see, see how those, those studies change. Excellent. Really topical point to end on there. 
Um, the return to work, whether that's three or four days, as you say, and those pretty big numbers, 70% plus. So nice point to end on. So thank you very much. A few concluding thoughts from me very briefly. So right now, obviously, we're all aware we're in the post-pandemic world, working from home, hybrid working, back to the office, the grand resignation, quiet quitting. All of these scenarios are in play. And they all mean that fluctuating occupant numbers, demographics demand, they make flexibility and agility simply business critical for commercial real estate developers, owners, landlords, and asset managers. However, that's the buck coming. If they do want to meet, even exceed their tenants' expectations, first, as evidenced by the survey, they need to know what those expectations are. Then, of course, they need to know how well they match up in terms of workspace that's fit for the needs of today, but also, of course, tomorrow. Managing this, it's a mix of, shall we say, responsiveness and future proofing is challenging. It depends not just on collecting data, but analyzing it, using it strategically, sustainably. And honestly, it can be a big ask, and it's being asked of building operations. So my final point would be they're not miracle workers. They need the tools, the tech, and in some cases, the training to do the job meeting or helping meet those tenant expectations so navigating this new world of work we've been talking about it's not easy but it's doable if you have the data and the analytics to make your maps and chart your course so there we are we are bang on time closing then a very big thank you to all our panelists jason kelleher stephen o'sullivan of course killian casey and our host at cim also to yourselves our virtual audience out there for joining us this lunchtime at your desks on your screens as mentioned, all be sent the recording plus another copy of the research report with all those fascinating stats that we've been discussing for the last 60 minutes. And a reminder, please kindly don't forget to complete the very short post event survey. It's really helpful for the organizers. So, look forward to seeing you all in the next session in this webinar series. Keep an eye on CIM's LinkedIn page and your email inbox, of course. Meantime, that's it for today. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Sus Meme. Thanks to the panel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.